Herman Melville's Moby Dick is beloved as one of the most profound and enduring works of American fiction, we rarely consider it a work of nature writing, or even a novel of the sea. In fact, Ishmael's sea yarn is in conversation with the natural writings of Emerson and Thoreau, and Melville himself did much more than live for a year in a cabin beside a pond. He set sail to the far remote Pacific Ocean, spending more than three years at sea before writing his masterpiece in 1851. Richard J. King's Ahab's Rolling Sea offers new insights not only into a cherished masterwork and its authors, but also into our evolving relationship with the briny deep, from whale hunters to climate refugees, on this episode of the NASO Video and Podcast. The North American Society for Oceanic History was created by maritime scholars who met in 1971 at the University of Maine. They recognized that in North America there was no forum for maritime history or a society devoted to the study and promotion of maritime history. The aim of the original group of organizers was to create a diverse organization based initially on Canadian and American membership, which would gain the interest of others. Now there are members worldwide. And it is this diversity of membership that continues to make NASO a truly unique organization. 2020 marked the first year in recent memory that NASA was unable to meet, and therefore we bring historians, archaeologists, and students who are scheduled to present. Welcome to the North American Society for Oceanic History. I'm your host, Sal McCogliano. The goal of the NASA podcast is to bring you some of the best historians, professionals, and up-and-comers in the field of maritime history. Today we're heading to Connecticut and being joined by Richard King. He's the author of the new book, Ahab's Rolling Sea, A Natural History of Moby Dick, an honorable mention in the past John Lyman Book Prize. Uh, Richard King is a visiting assistant professor of maritime literature and history at the Sea Education Association in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. Welcome, Richard, to the video, uh, NASO Video and Podcast. Thanks for having me, Sal. Oh, it's great to have you. And like I said, I'm really excited about uh, talking about your book. I think it's uh, just an amazing interpretation and got my copy of the book right here uh enjoyed it a lot i've got lots of notes and i'm going to try to get through it in in the time we have and uh you're a prolific author and i gotta say i, I was really uh, i went through your uh, uh past uh, writing and i i enjoyed almost all of them uh <laughs> the devil's cormorant a, a natural history a fantastic lobster uh women in the sea and the ruth i i have to say there was a moment of pause about canceling this 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 entire meeting when I saw meeting Tom Brady as, 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 as a kid who grew up in Long Island, New York and a massive Giants fan, it, it gave me the one pause was, was that book right there. But, but I'm a professional and, and we're going we're gonna, to, I'm just going to bowl right through that. And we're going to talk about <laughs> Ahab's rolling sea. We're not going to talk about Tom Brady. We're not going to talk about the, the New England Patriots. We're, we're definitely not going to talk about Tampa Bay because I don't think anybody really wants to talk about that. <laughs> But uh, we'll, we'll transition here and talk about uh, Moby Dick. And, and one of the things I wanted to talk about is I, I really loved your introduction, how you came about going into this topic. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, because I, I think it, it, it's so important to put the context for why you undertook uh, this interpretation of, of Moby Dick. Yeah, yeah. I guess maybe like a lot of listeners, I came to maritime history and literature in a way that was unexpected. And so I got at this job right out of college teaching at a um, high school semester at sea out of uh, Vancouver, Canada. And I, it was just an amazing job. Um, and so it was the first time I'd ever been on a ship or tied a bowline or anything like that. We sailed all the way around the Pacific. We did this enormous figure eight. And I did a terrible do- job teaching. I just, you know, it was my first teaching job. It was awful. Um, but we went to all these amazing places, and I really fell in love with being at sea. And the second uh, sort of semester, sort of, you know, the second six months, um, I thought that I would want to teach an English class that wasn't so much sort of correspondence, but really was about books about the ocean. And so when you pull into Sydney, Australia, what kind of book can you buy for 25 students? And so I thought, oh, look, there's a big pile of Moby Dick. I'll just, you know, get Moby Dick. And I had actually, as an undergraduate, never read it before. And um, so I was like, okay, you know, how hard could this be? And so I got copies for all the students and I 
um, got to read Moby Dick at sea on a ship in the South Pacific. And, it's, you know, it was really just kind of really a dream. You know, I, I sat down and read it for about, you know, four straight days, you know, uh, on the beach in Morea um, in French Polynesia. And, you know, there was, you know, on, on a, I would learn later on a beach, you know, that, that Melville himself could have uh, walked right along. And, um, and so then I was reading it a second time, you know, along with the students, and I was at sea underway, you know, obsessed with trying to find whales and look for whales. And um, I even had one moment um, when I climbed all the way up a loft and, you know, to, up to the royal, all the way out to the yard arm, and just trying to get away from sort of, you know, the chaos that happens on a ship. And off in the distance, I saw. Um, what I'm almost certain was uh, the blow of a sperm whale, and then I saw its tail go down, and it was just me up there, you know, 100 feet above the deck, and seeing that flukes go down in the horizon, and it was just one of the most moving experiences I've ever had in my life, um, because I'd been so infused with reading the novel and thinking about whales. Um, but I'd been teaching, like, so many new teachers, you know, about Milton and about Shakespeare and about style and, and all those things are so extraordinarily important to understanding Moby Dick. But for me, the novel has continued to be really about a living, breathing ocean and understanding what Melville experienced when he went out to sea and what other um, mariners experienced at sea and sort of what the naturalist naturalists knew about the ocean in the 1850s. And that was the basic premise of the book of sort of saying like, okay, what would Melville known? What would naturalists have known in the 1850s? How might Melville have tweaked the fiction for his own um, purposes for the novel? And then how does this compare to our understanding both um, biologically as well as sort of symbolically uh, of the ocean today? Yeah, I, you know, I, I have to agree with you entirely. I, the previous career I had before I became an academic, I was a mariner, so I sailed for, for seven years. And, and, and those moments when you're alone on a ship and out there in the ocean are, are just absolutely just captivating. And it, it feels like it's just you and the sea and there's nothing else out there. And, and, and one of the things I, I took away from the book that I found really important important was trying to capture what the ocean was like in that period and you know we tend to think oh it's the same it's water it's all it, there's no difference between them and many historians when they go back and look at like old battlefields will, will try to capture what what was the terrain like what did it look like then what was different then and that's what i got reading this this natural history of moby dick was so interesting and i, I want to kind of comment on on just a couple of titles you had in there you talk about the book and i found it really interesting you talk about ishmael being a proto-darwinist a, a proto-environmentalist and a climate refugee and i think that's such an important element there to, to kind of capture on it and I, I was wondering if you can expand on that a little bit and, and talk about it your chapters in here are, are not long but there's a lot of them and, and so you kind of do these little snippets of elements of the book and you talk about that but i was wondering if, you, if we could start maybe uh, and talk about this idea of of pre-Darwin, because this is, again, this is written before Darwin, before the Beagle, and how they capture that moment of, of understanding what's going on around them. Yeah, yeah, no, thanks. I, 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 that battlefield example is a really nice, nice one to sort of think about, because a lot of great, and, and, you know, and I have to say that I'm really honored that this book got an honorable mentioned for, you know, for a Maritime Historical Society, and so many great historians have been doing work about the history of ocean spaces, you know, um, uh, Jeff Bolster and Callum Roberts and a whole series of historians really looking at the environmental history of the ocean and trying to think about the biography of setting, um, whether it's a particular ocean. I know you did a podcast recently about the Gulf of Mexico, and, um, and so uh, that was certainly something I was trying to envision. You know, what did the, you know, some 10,000 young men and, and some women too looking over the rail in the 1850s see? How did they perceive that ocean? How did they think about it? And what did they actually see? Um, and how might those ocean spaces had been different? Um, in terms of the, those ideas of uh, thinking about Ahab and Ishmael and these and Queequeg and Dagu and thinking about these characters and how we read them in the 21st century, 
I think that's one of the things that has made Moby Dick so extraordinary. You wouldn't think this novel about whaling would survive for so long, but it, it has because it continues to be reinterpreted like any sort of great, you know, Shakespearean play, you know, uh, new ways to read it, new ways to think about it. And I really embrace all the ways to think about the novel and I'm excited about new interpretations. I wanted to play around with the idea of thinking about Melville's work, Moby Dick, as an environmentalist work and really thinking about it as a work of nature writing. Um, and so thinking about this in its place in 1851, right before, you know, eight years before the publication of On the Origin of Species in 1859, is a really interesting place to think about it. Um, and so in order to enter into the novel and think about that historical piece, I had to learn a little bit about natural theology, which is that idea of, that was happening with Lewis Agassiz and Emerson and sort of saying like, okay, all these uh, extraordinary scientific revelations are coming across, like the discovery of fossils and recognizing the age of the earth and even the recognition that some species can go extinct. Um, but at the same time, trying to square that with the teachings of the Bible. Um, and, you know, in the early 1850s, there was really no separation that we have today of you know the sort of religion and science you know you could do both really quite comfortably um and in fact you know to to just to learn about the natural world was to celebrate god and um in in the judeo-christian tradition and so it it is a really interesting way to think about the novel and recognize that even though Melville had not come across Darwin's, you know, the transmutation of species or uh, evolution by natural selection, Melville is playing around a little bit with the decentering of man and challenging quite subtly Louis Agassiz's chain of being. And that, you know, and that's one of the things that Ahab struggles so much with. How is this sperm whale that can dive deeper th than I can, that can see all these things that I can't see? And, um, you know, spoiler alert, in the end, it is, you know, uh, presumably the whale that survives and only one lucky human narrator. Um, so, so Melville seems to be playing a lot with sort of um, disassembling that chain of being that, that Darwin would as well. And I think that goes to an issue too. I mean, I mean, it's so easy in history to sit there and say there, you know, there's pre-Darwin and post-Darwin. But, but I, I think one of the things that came across in your book is is they're thinking about these issues already. Darwin, you know, as, as much as we want to think as, as Darwin is revolutionary, that all of a sudden, you know, he he does this voyage and and no one had been thinking about this before. When you start looking as you did in the inner workings of Moby Dick, you start realizing, okay, there's an understanding here of 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 key components of nature underway. I remember reading the line you had about Columbus, you know, you know, landing in the new world, but he had gone over hundreds of other worlds on the way there and, and, and hadn't thought about that. Whereas, the, you know, in the case of Moby Dick, they're exploring these, these new worlds, obviously to, to harvest whales, but they're experiencing all these new worlds, these new environments that they're going to. And you kind of break that down in, in different elements within the book. And I was wondering if you talk about some of those, you know, some of those elements that you thought that really leaped out at you in, in re, reading and, and having a critical eye at Moby Dick than, than a normal reader would have. Hmm, yeah. Yeah, I think I, I agree with you. There's something about, and one of it is just simply the image choices in the book. I was really lucky to do it with University of Chicago and they've got graphic, great graphic designers and are really interested in sort of making um, the visuals work. And it was really important to me to have a whole selection of color images um, because I know, I know, you know, as historians, we, we all know consciously that, you know, humans did not see the world in black and white etchings, you know, in the 19th century, but to be able to sort of imagine that world in color and to really imagine what it would have been like for these mariners for the first time to see these birds, to see these um, fish leaping out of the water, to see the colors of these um, islands in the South Pacific. It must have just been so mind-blowing. Um, and I think maybe maybe a good example would be uh, the sharks in Moby Dick. Um, because we, uh, you know, if, if 
you say to anyone just like, oh, think up a shark. You know, we have a pretty good idea in our heads, thanks to scuba, thanks to underwater photography, thanks to um, so many visuals where we really feel like we have a clear idea in our mind's eye of what a shark looks like, even that shark swimming underwater, which was not something that would have been easily accessible to a mariner in to, to anybody um, in North America in uh, in the mid nineteenth century. And so, in uh, in Moby Dick, what I did was I tried to sort of, as you said, look at a lot of these details either by species or by scene, and ask contemporary experts what did they think? What did they read in it? And so uh, I took the shark scenes to um, a shark expert at, in Moss Landing, uh, California. And also I corresponded with a uh, shark photographer and a cage diver in uh, off of South Africa. And both of them really explained to me how impressed they were with how accurate a lot of the information was that Melville describes, even, you know, which has this great sort of poetic value of where uh, Ishmael is describing these sort of circular holes that are cut into the whale's carcass by a, um, by a great white shark or some other kind of shark, you know, like a um, countersunk hole right in the, in the center. And that's in truth, you know, the sort of shapes that these sharks will make in the carcass of a whale. Um, and for whalemen, they were able to see sharks all the time feeding on a whale right next to their vessel. Whereas there are very few people today who have actually had any witness or any experience at all with a shark chomping on a whale carcass. It's really only by chance where um, someone at sea, a fisherman or uh, a naturalist or some sort of uh, eco-tourist boat or something like that is gonna, going to come upon something like that by chance. And so uh, my colleague off the coast of South Africa said he was really struck by the sound because he had come across it once and just the sound of those sharks chomping into the meat of the dead whale was so sort of horrific and stunning to him and that he He's never forgotten that sound. And that's something that Ishmael spends a lot of time with in Moby Dick, talking about that sound. And so moments like that really helped me uh, understand the novel better and to appreciate what Melville was doing from his own experience. I, I'm always taken, first of all, I love the chapter on sharks. The sharkishness was, was, was a great little phrase right there uh, it, it, and talking about it. But I, I'm always taken aback by, uh, it's gonna be a strange parallel, but I remember an interview done by one of the Apollo astronauts who landed on the moon, Al Bean, was fourth guy to land on the moon. And he always talked about the fact that they should, the NASA should have sent a poet up to the moon because we can never convey, you know, what what we saw and how it felt accurately. And yet that that's what I think Melville does in some ways. He, he's, he's, you know, he, he's almost writing a science fiction novel for, for the day because people have never seen this before, but he is able to convey it in such a way that, that you know, people can, you know, almost be there and, and, and really feel every moment. I think, I think that's what you're getting that with the shark right there is, is, is every moment there that he describes those sharks, you, you relive it and you see it and you hear it and it, it's there, except you're not there and you have to do it through a writer like Melville. And I was wondering, we'll take a step back for a minute and talk about Melville for a second. You know, does this get written by anybody else besides Melville with his background? Do you, there's some, do you need that experience that Melville has to be able to write this? And, 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 and why is it received in such a wide, I mean, it is such a, a, a greatly read book at the time. What, what, what's your perception about Melville and him writing this? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I would say, I, I agree completely about that idea of, uh, Melville likes someone on the moon and bringing his poetic capabilities as well as ex his experiential. And I, I think that is what makes Melville's novel so extraordinary in terms of a benchmark and thinking about the, the ocean in the 1850s, because there were other whale narratives, both fiction and nonfiction, that were out at the time. Melville was not the first or the last to write a book like this. But Melville, because he had spent nearly 
four years at sea um, on three different whaling vessels, 14 months on a man of war. He had gone transatlantic um, on two different voyages before writing Moby Dick. He had actually had that experience, but he also was a prolific reader. You know, he's very metatextual in the novel and tells you uh, so many of the things that he read or at least had on his shelf. And so he really was that amazing combination of someone who'd seen it himself, as well as someone who is up to date on the reading of the day. Uh, so, you know, I, I live uh, right next to Mystic Seaport and work with the museum sometimes. And a lot of the staff there will use Moby Dick as a reference point for maritime history because in so many ways, he really took pains to be accurate about the ways of whaling ship. And that was true for the ocean world too. I mean, there's no question he's a novelist and he's gonna take poetic license when he can for the purposes of the story. But at the same time, he really cared about trying to do his best to depict the natural world. And that is what made Melville such an extraordinary uh, recorder of both the natural world in the 1850s and our sort of American perception of the ocean writ large at that time. And, and that goes back to a thesis you had, which, which I found really interesting. You, you talk about this, and I, I just want to read this one quote you had in here. Uh, what I realized in the days that followed was that for me, Moby Dick is first and foremost a novel about the living, breathing, awe-inspiring global ocean and its inhabitants. So, I mean, for you, it's not really about, you know, whaling. It's not really about the ship. It, it's more about that natural history and, and what unveils to it. And, and I think going back to what you talked about in the conclusion with Ishmael being this proto-Darwinist and, and, and also a, a, a climate refugee, I found really interesting. You know, if, if you want to compare the modern world today, the, the living ocean today to the, the ocean that they experience today, I mean, what, what's the big, the big divide that you see that, that people should go back and look at Moby Dick in a more critical way than, than just reading it about an adventure tale about Ishmael and, and, and fighting, you know, what everyone always tends to turn Moby Dick into is this, is this, is this you know, controversy, this battle between beast and man. But, but it's not. It is so much more than that. So I was wondering if you can comment about what you see reading about the natural history of the 1850s, or actually 1840s, what he's writing about more likely there, uh, versus our plight today with the world's oceans. Sure. Yeah. And my favorite chapter that I turn to a lot is the chapter called Brit, uh, chapter 58, where a bunch of right whales are swimming through the uh, surface of the Indian Ocean. And he, in that little tiny chapter, Melville writes these sentences about the ocean and how he perceives the ocean uh, in, uh, in, in that mid-19th century. And what's extraordinary to me is that it's pretty similar to how we think about it today. We think about that ocean as a mortal, as it's going to live forever, you know, that it is, doesn't care about us. It can be savage sometimes, but only out of indifference. Um, and it's also, you know, as we get from Loomings, it is also a place for inspiration and it, it's a place for the wonders of the globe. And, and all that is really kind of true. Um, Moby Dick ends with, you know, that sort of ocean washing over human civilization and, and moving on. And in some ways, we really are still kind of afraid of the ocean and still think about it as indifferent. We're just thinking about it in different ways in terms of sea level rise and increases, increased intensities of hurricanes and potential for tsunami. And so we're still sort of afraid of the ocean, but for very different ways that we're understanding. The one major element that I think that is different between Melville's perception and ours is this idea that we can have some influence on the ocean world. And so when you really get into the research, you realize, oh my gosh, you know, Melville, on average, Melville's ocean was, you know, eight inches lower. You know, the idea that Melville could have the, the idea that Melville would imagine that humans could actually affect the very chemistry of the entire ocean, that we could affect the entire temperature of the ocean, that our actions ashore could melt icebergs on the other side of the globe, was beyond even imagination, 
like Melville's. And so the idea of stewarding the ocean or conserving the ocean or, you know, that, that, that we should be responsible for the ocean's health was, you know, that would have been, uh, if not heretical, certainly comical to Melville. Um, and I see that as sort of one of my major takeaways um, for the story. Does Melville start to think about that? But I mean, I, I got to imagine if you're a whaler, you have to push further and further, deeper, deeper into the Pacific. The, the whale pods are moving. They're, they're being depleted as they go in. They're eventually up in the Arctic uh, uh, going after whales. Uh, is that a beginning genesis, do you think? Do they start maybe getting that that concept that, well, maybe, you know, like, as you said, I agree with you. I, I don't think they could ever envision that they human beings could have the impact on something as vast as the ocean as we have had so far with raising uh, ocean levels, with salinity differences, temperature differences, the death of, of coral and, and, and pollutants going in. But do you think that maybe it's a good beginning that, that Melville's starting to figure out that maybe this is a factor that we're starting to have it? Because again, I, I do think there's the indications in Melville's book that, okay, we're starting to have an impact. Yeah, yeah. And the, the chapter that a lot of scholars were turned to is, uh, does the whale's magnitude diminish, will he perish? And that's where Melville really comes to reckon with that exact question. Like, hey, you know, are whales smaller today than they were um, a couple decades ago? And could we actually, our hunting in the 19th century, actually render whales extinct or at least impact global populations? And Melville, in the end, comes to the conclusion that actually, no, <laughs> no on both accounts, that the whales are not smaller today and that humans actually cannot affect whale populations. And he's particularly talking about right whales in that situation. And he's saying, you know, they're always going to be able to escape to their polar citadels up into the Antarctic and the Arctic. And, you know, it's true, Sal, it's, you know, it's, it's such an interesting point in uh, North American society to sort of think, okay, where, where are people on this issue in terms of extinction and human impact? And Melville recognized human impact ashore very, very well. He recognized deforestation. Thoreau was writing about the loss of grizzlies and wolves throughout New England. Melville's writing about the buffalo and using that example in that chapter. Um, and he's just reviewed a book just a year before, you know, talking about reduction of the buffalo out west. And so extinction and environmental damage is very well known ashore. Even like, you know, one of the, I've been spending a lot of time with John James Audubon recently, and he has this amazing letter, actually a journal entry, where he's imagining talking to Sir Walter Scott and saying like, hey, you got to get over here because the forests are being cut down and um, fish are being pushed out of rivers. And, like, and this is in the late 1920s. And so Americans are aware of the environmental damage, but for Melville, and I think that's part of the reason why the ocean is so appealing to Ishmael is that it is perceived to be the last wild ocean space. This is a place where humans really cannot impact. And from a his historical perspective, Melville's reasoning is not entirely absurd or sort of blind. You know, there's no question looking back on it in hindsight that what was happening, particularly with the right whales coastally, that um, whalers, mostly Americans, were moving from region to region and, loking, uh, and making local populations extinct and then, then moving to another local population. But to the whalemen, partly as rationalization, they just believed, just like you said, that at that point they were moving up into the Arctic, that, they were just, that the whales were just kind of moving away. They were, they were moving to different parts of this enormous ocean. When Melville was writing, they you know, that sort of major Arctic push, steel hulls, explosive harpoons, diesel engines, that technology is on the way, but it's not something Melville saw um, or anticipated entirely. And that goes to another depiction that's in the book, which I think is a really important one, is, is the beauty and the cruelty of the sea. I, I mean, a lot of people romanticize the ocean and, and they turn it into this, this, you know, love fe feature and everything. But it, it, as you mentioned quite aptly, you know, 
you know, in the end, the sea wins, you know, the Pequot loses, the sea wins. And, and you have a quote here, which I, I just absolutely love. Uh, we still envision the sea, even with all our technological advancements and scientific knowledge, as relentless and indifferent and immortal and sublime and eager to lure us in with a trace of sympathy and kindness, then kick our ass and not even look back. And, and, and I have to 100% agree. And, and then, then you vividly put that to, to, to point with the, the loss of Concordia, you know, the ship that you sailed on earlier and, and, and how the, the sea is, is absolutely brutal in, in, in some ways. And, and even though you, you have a romantic, you know, a romanticized vision of maybe the sea, through Melville, he comes back in the end and, and is really paints it as, as, as dark. It, it has no compassion and no feeling. And, and I was wondering if you can expand on that a little bit, because I, I really enjoy that element that you talked about and, and how this, the sea is, is, is kind of neutral in many ways. It, it is just going to be what it is, but we can affect it. And I think that's the thing that, that maybe Melville misses, as you just mentioned, that, that we're having an impact on it and it may not be able to react the way it did in the past. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, and may maybe the way to think about that would be to your earlier question about thinking about Ishmael as a climate refugee. And, and I know that's a little bit kind of out there as an idea, and it's also a personal reading for me, but we don't know for sure where the novel ends. We know that it's on the equator, and there's sort of an argument to suggest that maybe it's near where at the longitude of where the Essex um, was hit. But I like to think because for couple of different factors, but also for the poetry of the novel, for me, that it's actually more towards the center of the South Pacific, you know, equatorial, um, you know, 180 degrees longitude and, um, and the equator, and which is really right through the vast island country of Kiribati. And for me, I really think of Ishmael today, and I got to sail there on the Robert C. Siemens, on one of their, the Sea Education Association voyages. And I spent time on that vessel every day, just spending two hours up at sea, looking out on the ocean and trying to get a sense of what that whaler's experience might've been like. And I also tried to imagine a, you know, Ishmael's little head floating there um, for 24 hours uh, on that coffin and what that might've been like. And it's really not, too large a jump to think about all these low island nations, particularly in Kiribati, who are, who are watching sea level rise and uh, affecting their water supply. And really, probably in our children's generation, Kiribati is going to be entirely uninhabitable. And for the first time in human history, we're going to have an entire nation with people that have no soil, that have no land, that really will be truly orphans. And so most listeners know very well the, the biblical Ishmael. And so here is this whole country of South Pacific Ishmaels that are being sent off their land because of sea level rise. And the connection that I, that I find even more fascinating is that at the end of Moby Dick, Ishmael, uh, when Tashtigo goes down, there's this, this skyhawk, this big black skyhawk that is coming and pecking at the top of the Pequod. And then these skyhawks are also leaving Ishmael alone as he's floating there. And it's pretty easy to, thanks to Bob Madison and other scholars, to recognize that those skyhawks, those seahawks are actually frigate birds. Um, and the frigate bird, the big black um, seabirds, the ones that fly so high and soar in those thermals and have that big red sort of pouch that blows up that you might have seen on nature channels and things. Uh, that bird is the symbol, it's on the flag of Kiribati and there's this amazing song and poem that talks about uh, how the frigate bird leaves home and then comes back to try to find its island and its island is underwater. And so the sort of all these connections to how we might read this novel today in the 21st century, knowing about Kiribati, knowing about the frigate bird, knowing about their stories really interweaves so extraordinarily well. And for me, I can't read the novel any other way now. I want, I want to take you back for a second here, because one of the things that I, I love to do on this series is, is talk to authors about how they 
go about their research for, for, for a project like this? So, I mean, obviously one of the first things is, is, <laughs> is read Moby Dick, but more importantly is, is, is the next step. How did you go about kind of really breaking this down? Because again, the multitude of people you talk to in this book is, is, is apparent. I mean, the, the amount of research that went into it. So I was wondering if you talk a little bit about your research method in, in, in tackling this, this subject. Sure. Yeah. And I think, you know, we all sort of have this book in us, right, where it kind of feels like it takes you a long time to write, but it also feels like it's your whole career, you know, uh, put together. And so I've been super lucky with my academic position. So I taught for many years with the uh, Williams College Mystic Seaport Maritime Studies Program, which is based at Mystic Seaport. I taught literature to see there and we could go on the Charles W. Morgan every day and we would read Moby Dick on the Charles W. Morgan, uh, the last American wooden whale ship in Mystic. And so that was just so foundational. And I had so many extraordinary colleagues that taught me, Susan Beagle and Mary Kay Burkai Edwards as Melville scholars. But then the program is very interdisciplinary. So I was working with marine ecologists and oceanographers and marine policy professors and maritime historians. And, um, and then I also teach with the Sea Education Association where we go out on oceanographic vessels under sail um, all around the world. And so I've been trained to work with colleagues in different disciplines. And it's been so natural for me to read Moby Dick and to just go down the hallway and say, hey, um, what kind of Carl might he be talking about here? Or uh, is that possible that that whale could do that thing? And, and so it was a very natural progression for me to um, think about Moby Dick in that way and, in, and to connect to modern uh, academics, marine biologists, oceanographers, whale watch operators, sailors, and ask them how they read particular scenes. And that was so fun. It was, yeah, it was such a privilege to be able to do. Um, and then it also worked well. Uh, my spouse is an oceanographer and we took a sabbatical in New Zealand and I got to go out with a uh, sperm whale researcher and which is pretty important because you know if you're writing about Moby Dick and you haven't seen sperm whales you know your your cred goes down pretty far <laughs> and I had never actually like real I mean I've been on plenty of whale watches and things but I never really seen sperm whales before other than that fluke way off in the distance so uh, her name is Marta Garabobo, and uh, she studies uh, sperm whale ecology. And off of the South Island of New Zealand, Kaikoura, there's a resident juvenile male population. And so I got to go out with her for multiple days and really see sperm whales up close. And it just, it was just so extraordinary. I just learned so much. Um, so uh, I've just been really lucky with a lot of super opportunities. And, and, you know, as you well know, there are so many scholars that have written about Melville. And I really have not, I think of myself more of as, as a synthesizer for a popular audience. There's so much extraordinary scholarship and the dissertations just keep coming out and the papers keep coming out. And I still find out, find papers by um, scholars about the natural history of Moby Dick or a particular aspect that I didn't even know about when I was researching. And so I think of myself more synthesizing all this extraordinary research that's been out there and hopefully making it a really um, digestible and useful text for a wide range of readers. Well, I have to, I have to echo how enjoyable I found the read. I, 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 compliment you i compliment uh, uh chicago press too you're right it is superbly illustrated i, I think i think every time you turn there, there's something there that helps explain exactly what you're writing which is is so hard to get in books these days i think they do a fantastic job with that uh, when you wrote the book what was your intended audience who are you hoping to reach with this book uh, i'm always uh curious about that yeah yeah no actually it's it's been kind of tough because uh i wanted to write a book that um, people would read cover to cover, but also would be a useful text for an undergraduate, for a graduate student, someone teaching Moby Dick to just say, okay, what's happening with that great squid ski, you know, with the giant squid scene? And they could just go right to the giant squid. And so, you know, I, I, we could talk for a while about sort of this particular process and the proposal I wrote. And I definitely had the, you know, with with one publisher. So what, well, you know, what is your narrative arc? And I was like, ah, what is my narrative arc? Um, and so 
I don't think there is a real danger of the book and I, I'm not sure I got there all the way of, of it trying to be too many things, of trying to be a book that is useful for the scholar as well as a book where someone could just sit down and read it cover to cover. And so I was trying to do both and I'm not always sure I um, struck the right balance, uh, but I, it, I agree with you with the images and the whole time I was often thinking to myself, well, at least I've got really good pictures <laughs> because I agree. I think some of the pictures I found or the people supplied with me or um, I just, yeah, have just been fantastic. So I, yeah, I love the imagery in the novel too. I'm not in the novel in my book. And, uh, and I'm really appreciative of, of the graphic designers and how they, uh, how they helped me put it together. Well, you know, I picked up the book to read it and, I, and I'm not a natural historian by any means. And, and, but you know, I've read Moby Dick. And so I was like, okay, this may be interesting. I'm not exactly sure. And you know, I was taken away because again, it, it, it's scene by scene, you're kind of breaking it down. And, and for me, I think the format you had is great because it does allow you to go back and made, it actually made me at points, go grab the book and, and look at it and sit there and say, I wanna read this one section again and go back and look at it. And I, and I thought that was a very useful method to look at this. I also think, it, again, it, it's a great snapshot for what the world looked like. I mean, we tend to, you know, I, I could pick up, you know, I could pick up a book on, on democracy in America and, and, and get, you know, the view of America by de Tocqueville in the 1830s. But, you know, what's the oceans like in the 18, you know, mid 1800s? And, and, and I think, you know, I wouldn't think about that with Moby Dick, but now I do. Now it's like, okay, now I get that, 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 that image is like, okay, this is, this is what I need to look at those books for is to get that imagery of what's going on in the background. And again, I, I think we all too often paint the ocean as this blue, you know, patchwork. It's flat. It, there's no, motion to it but as you know it's not that it's anything but that I, I, i've talked with rachel slade and, and she's done that great book on the el faro and you mentioned that uh in in your introduction that 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 the sea is 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 it can be you know you know it consumes its own you know and there's no trace left and, and it's easy to move on and, and i thought you capture that really well uh what's your next project what are you thinking about uh embarking on now i know this is uh still uh running and you're still talking about that which is great but uh what, what's next for you yeah, yeah, I have, um, uh, it's actually a, a really nice segue because it's the same idea of trying to think about, okay, what did the ocean look like in the past and how do we consider, because, you know, many of us know about whaling logbooks and mariners journals and they do give us some sense of what the ocean looked like, but not so much from a cultural standpoint or from an aesthetic standpoint about how people saw the so ocean spaces in particular particular animals. And so I've been really lucky to work with Christoph Ermscher, who's an Audubon scholar. And so we've been co-editing a anthology of John James Audubon's uh, writings about the ocean. And it's the same kind of thing of Audubon, very few people know that about what Audubon wrote at sea and the drawings he did of Mahi Mahi, of shark, of ocean seabirds. And his, you know, we have one really, really good journal that still remains of Audubon doing a transatlantic. And what do we do with those sort of anecdotal observations? And can it help scientists today? Can it help environmental historians? Or is it more about a sort of aesthetic shifts or changes? Um, so that is a project I've been helping out with, although Christoph is, you know, he's the brains of the operation. I'm sort of just helping out with um, putting it together. And that'll also be with the University of Chicago Press and come out next year. And then the project I'm working on just starting and, uh, you know, as you know, sometimes it's hard to sort of say it out loud, you know, because you don't know if it's going to happen. But I'm really interested in uh, single-handed sailors and uh, it really the, along the same lines of how, what was it like to go to sea when you're Slocum, when you're Harry Pigeon, when you're Ann Davison in the 1950s on this tiny little boat, alone, quiet, slow, day after day, and what did you see? Um, and did you see it in the same way we did? Uh, we do today. Um, did you see anything specific that might give us some clues as to how the ocean has changed, whether it's a particular species or again, just how we view those? So, so I'm doing a, a, almost like a, a natural history, maritime history of single-handed sailors. That's my I, I'm, plan. I, I'm always fascinated by single-handed sailors. I, I, I don't understand the will to go do that and, and, and to have that fortitude to be out there that long and, and, and face something 
like the ocean by themselves. It, there, there's something to be said for company when, when, you know, when, when things <laughs> go bad to have somebody around because there's just too many variables out there for, for going to see by oneself. I want to thank our guest, Richard King, for joining us for our NASO video podcast. We'll have a link to all his works in the show notes, except for the Tom Brady book. That's the one we will omit. Uh, if you liked our video podcast, be sure to click like on YouTube or give it five stars in your podcast provider. Please subscribe to our channel to receive updates as we continue to interview maritime historians. You can follow NASO on Facebook, on Twitter, at NASO underscore history. The best way to follow NASO is to become a member. As such, you receive our newsletter, our quarterly journal, The Northern Mariner, which we publish jointly with the Canadian Nautical Research Society. Go to www.naso.org and click on membership to join. Until our next talk, keep sailing.